Hey guys, Blake Calhoun and another episode of Almost Professional, the podcast about mobile filmmaking, DIY filmmaking, indie filmmaking, and today short filmmaking. I have a great interview today. This is an interview episode with an Australian filmmaker named Paul Henry. Now his name may sound familiar to you if you follow mobile filmmaking or if you've entered the Filmic Pro contest in the past, their short film contest. Their film, No Hard Feelings, played, and it was the one shot on a DOF adapter from B-Script with traditional lenses. And it stood out to me because, well, it didn't look like an iPhone short film. I actually did an interview with the DP, a guy named David Cleave for my YouTube channel, and also did a podcast interview from that as well. And so today is kind of a follow-up because the good news is the film is now available on my YouTube channel. We're premiering it today, Thursday, September 9th. And so this interview that you're about to listen to is a companion to that premiere and a further chat with the actual filmmakers, in this case, Paul Henry. Paul Henry is an actor, a writer, director based in Melbourne, Australia. He and his counterpart, James Ballard, made this film again with Dave Cleave, the DP. And they did it on a shoestring budget, which all of us that make short films do. But this one, they really, they took it to the next level because even though it was a no budget film, it really doesn't look like it. They were able to get a lot of production value. And part of that is because they shot in Indonesia. And so in this interview, I go into mostly the non-technical aspects of the film because I went over all that with Dave Cleave in my previous interview. And I would encourage you, if you haven't yet, listen to that or watch it on YouTube. But a super interesting conversation, partly just to get the point of view of someone working and living in Australia. The film business is the film business. That's the cool thing. And so they go through the same things that we do here in the States. In other words, struggling to get your projects made, et cetera, et cetera. Although they've had a lot of success. One thing I learned during our conversation is they did a series of videos called September 87. You may have caught these on YouTube. They are 1980s inspired music videos with original music by James Ballard. And Paul and James co-direct those as well. And because of those, and this is a really interesting twist to the story, they now are having an opportunity to produce something bigger. And we go into that in the podcast interview as well. And so from the short film, the iPhone short film, and the other short films they've made, short form content, they have parlayed that into a larger project that appears to be going to streaming or traditional television. So not only is their film an inspiring example of what you can do with a phone, but it's also inspiring to see where those projects can lead and where they can take you in the future as a filmmaker. I recorded this interview with Paul via Zoom, and so it has some of the normal technical difficulties you might be accustomed to with the Bluetooth sounding audio. There's also some wind noise. His side was outside. You know, he's in Australia. He's hanging in the outback or wherever he is. Now, I think he was near a beach actually. And since I recorded this on Zoom, if you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify or wherever, you might consider checking this one out on my YouTube channel. I am posting my podcast now on my second YouTube channel. And so there is a video component. Either way though, thanks for listening or watching. Here's my interview with Paul Henry. So just briefly, Tell me a little bit about yourself, who you are, what your involvement in the movie was. Obviously you starred in it and why you guys chose to shoot this on a phone. Uh, my name is Paul Henry. I uh, co-directed uh, this film with James Ballard, who is very much my creative counterpart. Uh, I produced, uh, co-directed and acted in the film. And uh, we shot it on the iPhone. I primarily because Filmic Pro make an incredible app uh, that we used uh, to make it, really. And um, we just wanted to experiment with the technology and, and we're very impressed with what that app could uh, turn the iPhone really into. So that's, that's the main reason. 
Was there another reason beyond the tech aspect though? Was there, was it a money thing? Was it a portability thing? Yeah, well, there were a lot of benefits and it was very freeing just shooting on an iPhone in many ways, especially when you go into Indonesia, the location where we shot it, you, it's very hard to take in a lot of gear and everything. And then you got to pay for all sorts of permits and things like that. So just going in with an iPhone, a few lenses and battery packs and, you know, things like that. It's, it's just a lot easier in terms of that. And when I say freeing, I more so mean that you're not, you're not so focused on the cinematography aspect of it. So, you know, you can, you just let things sl slide and let things go because it, it's very freeing in that. And for those reasons, you know, and, and also Filmic Pro had a, a competition, um, which they run annually and, uh, it gave us a deadline and, um, it was, it was a really great competition. It got a lot of eyeballs on it as well. And so tell me a little bit about your background. Well, first of all, where are you right now? I am in my hometown of uh, Byron Bay in northern New South Wales here in Australia. Um, it's a beautiful beach town with basically got rolling hills and you got a lot of rural areas. And right now, believe it or not, I'm only about a 10 minute drive to some of the most beautiful beaches in Australia. So this is where I grew up and um, I've been, I've only come home about two weeks ago because um, I'm kind of in transition of going to LA in about a month's time for something I'm working on. So that's where I am right now. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here considering all the madness going on in the world. Yeah, yeah. We're recording this during the COVID pandemic for those listening in the future. But well, for us in the US, I've never really been or traveled in Australia. Where is that in relation to the bigger cities like Sydney or, or Melbourne, et cetera? Yeah, so um, this is about a two hour flight from Melbourne. Um, I always get my north, south, east, west mixed up, but um, the closest major city to here is Brisbane. And then beyond that, uh, you have Sydney, which um, Sydney's about a six hour drive from here. Okay. So um, yeah, that's kind of geographically where it is. Um, but it's, it's kind of, it started off in the 90s, like a sleepy little surf town, uh, or I should say 80s is when it was, but now it's kind of blown up into a real, uh, excuse me tourist destination um so it's um it's kind of it's blown up quite a bit and interestingly enough actually for all the sort of filmmakers out there it's it's really blown up as a film hub because uh you got chris hemsworth living here now and on the gold coast as well they've built a lot of film studios and because of the pandemic uh a lot of the bigger films in the states and in europe that have been shut down frequently because of people testing positive uh, because the case numbers are so low in Australia all the insurance companies are underwriting films that will be made here so it's actually really good for Australian filmmakers and actors and and also and you know crew members and everything because uh, a lot of, a lot of productions are uh, are coming here and are happening here currently um, and they've also built a film studio in a town called Ballina only about 45 minutes away I think that's about two months away from construction. And so there's a lot going on here as well, you know, and they're flying a lot of Americans out here and then using a lot of Aussie crew and actors. So it's kind of a, it's, it's an interesting time and an, an exciting time to kind of be in this region. But you're based in Melbourne. You kind of answered my question. I was going to ask how the film scene is there, but it, is the film scene as big or bigger in Melbourne? Well, it, it has been a real hub. They've got the Dark and Film Studios there where a lot of big productions get made. Uh, I know there was a Liam Neeson production happening there just recently, but because it has been so locked down, uh, sadly, the arts has kind of been crushed a little bit at the moment. Um, hopefully when you know they get on top of things, it'll kick back off. But I was talking to my agent recently and he was just saying, you know, New South Wales is very much, you know, New South Wales and Queensland, are the two sort of states which border each other, they're really, you know, they're really the places to be for, for filmmaking, uh, professional filmmaking at the moment. And I mean, even independent filmmaking as well, because the restrictions are so tight that you're not even really allowed to do, you know, even small productions. So that's very much the film hub of Australia right now. Okay. 
So are you guys and both you and James, do you work as professional filmmakers, as actors? What is your background? What brought you to make this short film? Yeah, well, James and I, um, and also, sorry, James couldn't be here. Everyone watching, he really apologizes. He had to actually go and get a COVID test um, just very randomly about 20 minutes prior to this interview. So apologies to you, Blake, and to anyone watching, but he, he sends his sincere apologies. And But James and I met in uh, drama school back in the day a while ago, and um, we kind of did that. And we started off as actors very much still are actors, you know, and uh, we kind of did gigging jobs here and there, you know, on, you know, a couple of the Australian TV shows here, the regular sort of cop shows, bits and bobs and everything like that. And um, James is like a remarkable cinematographer. He's a bit of a savant, you know, like he's incredible with music, uh, editing, color grading, like everything. And he's an amazing actor as well. He's just one of those guys that can kind of do it all. So him and I just always had a very close creative bond because of that. I'm not very good uh, on the technology side of things, but we write together, we, we direct together, we do a lot of things together. So we basically want to do it all. So we figured well, we want to keep acting for sure. We, but the things we were acting, we didn't really love. So we just kind of organically came to the conclusion, let's just keep making our own stuff. and then. We produce our own stuff and we also, you know, we both have agents, so we, we audition for things here and there. But we've kind of now just, it's been very freeing because all the things that we have made have built and built and built and led on to bigger and better things. So we just keep doing our own thing. And now that we produce, we get back end on things and, you know, we do commercials and it's actually taken us all around the world. But it's it's come from just doing basically short form stuff as as you know, trajected us, if that's a word, <laughs> and given us a tra trajectory, I should say, to, um, you know, basically get paid and, and do all sorts of things. So now we can put those funds into more of our creative projects. And, and also, it's just, we love this to keep making things. So regardless of where we are, or what we're doing, we now have the ability to, to, to make what we want to make. So it, it's very freeing creatively, you know. Yeah, that that's that's great to hear. I wasn't sure because a lot of short filmmakers in particular don't do this as their day job. You know, they're pursuing the dream, so to speak. It sounds like yeah. you guys are this is your day job. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, we do a lot of other hustling. We're pretty creative with that. You know, we we have a few other avenues that, you know, give us a bit of passive income and that sort of thing. But yeah, luckily we don't really, um, I hope it doesn't sound like arrogant or anything like that, but we've just been kind of savvy with um, with being able to navigate things where our focus now is entirely on on filmmaking and and television. And, and so, yeah, we can kind of do as we please. I mean, we work really, really hard with all that uh, other stuff, but, you know, we, we hustle basically like... Uh, I don't want to make it sound like we can just do whatever we want. We, we we work very, very hard and we do long hours, but it's it's all in the realm of filmmaking now. So, you know. That's great. That's great. Well, how did you guys come together on this particular project? I mean, obviously you work together and you're doing a lot of things, but how did this project come to be? We had done a couple of trips over to uh, Indonesia, uh, Bali particularly, uh, a little place called Changu. And it's just absolute paradise over there. And it's only a six hour flight from Australia. It's a, it's a really common tourist destination. And about, I think I'm, I'm going to say six or seven years ago, we made a short film called Sengatan, uh, directed by my uncle, Frank McGree, who, um, who's a pretty well-known actor here. And it was his kind of one of his, uh, I think he made a couple shorts, but it was his first sort of like big short. We shot it on the Air Sony A7S, I think it was. And um, it was a really guerrilla run and gun shoot. And ever since we did that, we just like, it's a very, very special place to make films. Like the light is constantly beautiful uh, and you can get anything you want there. And the people there, like the Indonesian and Balinese people there are just so hospitable and amazing. And basically anything you need, they say yes to. And they're, they're really accommodating. They're just amazing, amazing people. And we've got lifelong 
friends there now uh, forever. And I, I actually really want to start. A, I was going to do a long term lease on a villa there to start as a little production company. So even if I wasn't making films there, I'd have it as somewhere that I'd go to to edit any other projects because you can live very cheaply there and everything's very accessible. It's easy to get to. I mean, post uh, pre pandemic, it was obviously. Right. Um, so that's on hold a bit now, but um, it was just like a, a, we were kind of romanticized by the beautiful locations there and just the accessibility. And also we were kind of obsessed with that weird, like expat vibe, you know, there's kind of like something kind of interesting and sleazy and like a Florida type vibe of, you know, that weird, you know, it's kind of a strange thing when, when Westerners go and they take up, you know, a home in, in, you know, somewhere in Southeast Asia or, you know, somewhere in South America, there's always something interesting in that to me, which is kind of what the Rodney character was based on. Mm. Um, uh, so yeah, that's what kind of drew us to it was just an absolute love for that place. And, you ride around on a scooter, you find your location, then you got a van with your equipment and crew and you just shoot. And it's, it's just very freeing and, and very, very, very guerrilla style. So which is what I love. So yeah. Pretty- I'm, I'm a big fan of guerrilla. Sometimes I've worked on bigger shows and when you have a 30 or 40 or hundred person crew, while that can be great, depending on what you're doing, it also just, you can't do any, I mean, it's so slow. It moves like the military, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I've worked on a bunch of like really big productions and it's like the, the stop and start and waiting and everything like that. It's, oh, it's yeah. Hurry of, up and wait. Big time. Yeah, <laughs> big time. And also Dave Cleave, uh, who, you know, you did that great interview with. Yeah. I'm so glad that you did that as well, because um, he answered all of the sort of technical questions so uh, beautifully. And you asked such great questions with that. So. I feel like uh, if anyone were to watch this, please also go back and watch the the other one you did with Mr. David Cleave because he is he's just such a talented DOP and um, he's a great director as well. So it, it was really a great combination of um, me, James, and Dave because James and I were directing and you know Dave shooting it and you know he he's just a great creative mind as well. So as much as he was a DP, he, you know he was very involved in you know, all the little meetings of writing and scheduling. And, you know, he was just, he's one of those guys that's just so passionate that he's just down for everything. Like if if you want to get him to help with rewrites or or, or anything, you know, he's always there. And I basically only work with my friends. And so (laughs) it's very easy for me to compliment them because I love them dearly. But He's, a, he's an amazing guy. So Yeah, well, I will say that after watching the behind the scenes and talking to Dave, I think he was also the PA. He was also craft service. He was also locations manager. <laughs> you guys had, Hitler, you had to do it I mean, all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you mentioned writing. Who wrote the script or was it a collaborative effort on that too? No, J- James and I churned it out in like two weeks, I think, the script, because it all happened really quickly. We basically were just like, okay, there's a deadline for the Filmic Pro competition. Um, and then we were just like, I think we have enough time. Let's just do it, which was wonderful because James is a real perfectionist. Um, and it's a reason why his work is so good, but it just means that if we don't have a deadline, it can take forever. Uh, I always say deadlines are super important for creatives because we'll sit there and you'll revise it and re-edit it and which is good, like you're saying, but eventually Mm. you just got to get out there and do it. And it gets people to all kinds of filmmakers to get out there and actually make films, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, James always say, uh, he always says, uh, pressure makes diamonds, you know? Mm. So I love the pressure. I kind of thrive under it. And then it's great. It's like, it gets to a point where it's like, it's gotta be released. It's got to. So even if it's not perfect, it might be perfect to you, but it won't be perfect to someone else. So I'm very much of a, you get it to a point where you love it enough. And then you just put it out there and you allow other people to be the judge, you know, and I, I really like that, you know, because the, I truly do love, you know, diversity of opinion. So if people dislike it, it's, that's fine by me. But it's if I love it, that's kind of I, th- I think with filmmaking, it's an interesting thing. It's like. You can really get a sense of whether you if you put something out there and you kind of have that feeling like yeah, I hope people are going to like it and that sort of thing, then it's probably not right. But 
if you just truly like it and love it, then you know it's it's up to the gods from from there. You know, so I, I find that very freeing, and I've only learned that kind of late in, in the last couple of years, and it's that once again has been quite freeing. You know, yeah, but it's, it's also one of those things as a filmmaker. I'm sure you and when you look back at your old work stuff you loved just even a year or two ago, sometimes I cringe and I'm like, oh, I hate what I did. But I think that's good because it means you're learning from your past mistakes, you know? Oh, definitely. Definitely. James and I made, uh, one of the first things we did together was like this black and white. It was kind of like a Schindler's List. It was black and white style thing. And it was about, it was all set in one location. And it was like we were trying to make a film, as it was a short film, uh, and it was, we were trying to kind of like mimic what we thought people liked or would want. And we did that. That was like, I'm talking like nearly 10 years ago now. And we spent, we put so much effort into it and we re-edited it and redid so many things. And it got to a point where genuinely we just went, let's not release this. <laughs> and we never have. And I never want to because um, it just, just didn't land and we didn't like it and it was disingenuous so that was a huge learning curve and i'm actually glad we did that but uh i'm i'm glad it was a huge mistake because we what we learned was so valuable that uh, it was it was worth it in the end you know yeah like a test run almost you know (laughs) yeah yeah and there's and there's been plenty of stuff as well that i'll look back at and i'm like ugh. I do cringe, but, you know, I take it on the chin. You know, it's a tough pill to swallow sometimes. But yeah. there's a saying by, uh, of all people, it's uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, I'm a big fan of MMA, and he's Conor McGregor's coach. And he's also like a, he's a real uh, mentor um, uh, and a true martial artist. But he's like, you win or you learn. You know what I mean? So there's no losing. You you just you either win or you learn. And we learn we learned a lot from all our past mistakes, I think. And it's a part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. Well, how did you guys handle the code directing? Because you were both in the movie. It's one thing if you're you know what I'm saying? That's that did he direct you and you direct him, or did you just share it across the board? Yeah, we just kind of we him and I just flow together very much so. So we could be in a scene together and then it's like cut and in between it. We'll just have a quick discussion, uh, you know, refer to James. Uh, and also I had Frank, uh, Frank McGree. Uh, he was like a, a co-producer on it as well. And him being coming from an acting background, he was really good as well at just being like, try this and this. So it was very collaborative in that sense. Um, so yeah, we just had, we just had a great team and also a chap named James Stanistry, a dear friend of mine. He was kind of just an all rounder as well. And he had his input here and there as well. And it was very just, yeah, very collaborative, but it was all, it would often just be James and I having very quick conversations in between takes, go back, look at the rushes plan the next day. Pretty, uh, pretty frantic, but also um, just very enjoyable because when you're working with people you love, you know, it doesn't matter if, if things get heated or, or in, in, heated barely, it would just be like, that nothing's precious with us, you know, right. if we think something sucks. It sucks. It, it, when we go, we quickly figure it out. So that's kind of how that, that side of things worked as well. Was it the same in post-production or did you guys share, you said you're not technical. Did you maybe, did he cut some rough cuts and then you guys would look at them together kind of thing? Yeah. I normally, James and I have like a, an office that we share. It's like one of those co-working office spaces mm-hmm. and we did have one in Melbourne, but now that I've left Melbourne, um, we, uh, but it very much works. Uh, like I'll sit over James's shoulder to the point where I annoy him enough. Course, that he's, yeah. <laughs> he's like, get it, go. It's always for any editors out there. I know how annoying it is to have someone being like, do this, do that. And it's like, they've got to read dig a million things and premiere or whatever they're working with. So James is really, uh, he takes the reins on that pretty big time, but he, you know, I always have plenty of notes and everything, but because him and I are kind of so creatively in sync, he, um, he always takes things on board and then he'll work his magic. And I mean, the guy is beyond talented with that type of stuff. So sometimes we'll get an edit or an assembly edit from someone else and then he'll work his magic. And he really is a perfectionist. So he will finesse and finesse and finesse and his timelines will have like, it looks like a, uh, an algorithm, but it's got like, tw- you know, it's a, it looks like a, an, a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> it's, 
Yeah. So he he's very all the, la- all the layers everywhere, right? All the yeah. layers, we should say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so, yeah, that's his side of things for sure. Yeah, no, that's great. But that that's that's how good collaborations work. You you both know your strengths, and that's that's great. Relating back to the shoot, had you ever shot anything? Not you personally, but just in general, a uh, professional project on a phone? No. Okay. No, that was the first one. So we did uh, some test shoots back in Melbourne before we headed off. Um, and then we ordered a bunch of gear from Beast Grip. Um, mm-hmm. They're an amazing company. So I want to give a big shout out to them. And they actually recently sent us a whole bunch of gear as well uh, for free. And we're going to shoot something for them very, very soon as well because we're so generous with that. So um, a big thank you to them, you know, for being so supportive. And their gear for anyone wanting to shoot on an iPhone is phenomenal. It's like, it's such high quality and it's getting better and better. And they've just released a bunch of new stuff for the iPhone 12. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a big shout out to that company. They're amazing. The iPhone 13 is right on the horizon too. So they change every yeah. year. Um, yeah. But they um, are, they're a good company and they support the community uh, very well. We shot something recently, which I've had to keep under wraps with Filmic Pro. And they have just released... Uh, an update and uh, they've released uh, a new thing called filmic looks and they are lots which you can buy through the app. and um, they uh, came to us and they asked us to do they gave us total creative freedom a little bit of a budget and we shot a um, like an advertisement basically for them using one of their looks and uh, it's got a few updates to it and everything as well but they launched it about two hours ago so anyone watching this, it'll be obviously a bit later on. But if you jump on to uh, my Instagram or the Filmic Pro Instagram or their official YouTube channel, you will see a lovely little like minute, 30 second uh, project that we shot uh, once again using the iPhone. And uh, I'm actually glad that I'm able to announce it to you, Blake, first and foremost. So uh, it will be still relatively hot off the press, but uh, I'm really, really happy with it. And uh, it's really exciting because it's just a lot. There was no like post-production grading or anything like that. And we chose the Fitz look, which I found to be the most sort of film looking uh, LUT. And uh, I'm really happy with how it turned out. And uh, so please go and check that out. Um, it's, it's very exciting. Yeah, that's cool. I'll, I'll link it in the description of this. I knew they were working on that stuff, but I didn't know yeah. exactly when it was going to be released. Um, you know, I hear I hear the rumor mill, but uh, that that's yeah. awesome. That's great, and then yeah. it's cool so they I'm reached out to you guys. So yeah, well, I'm glad. Uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're we're actually in talks with them to do a lot of other exciting stuff as well. Uh, uh, Neil and Elliot and Kevin over at the company, they're just they're amazing guys, and they're so supportive, and and they are very much just like they love supporting guys like us, and we love working with them. So I hope to do a lot of stuff with them. They've got a lot of amazing stuff in the works and they're just great people to work with so and i understand that you know elliot who is their product manager and has been for a long time and i know elliot as well how was how did he help you guys out on the short yeah he was he was amazing so uh, elliot and i have known each other uh we went to high school uh here uh in mullumbimby uh which is known as the biggest little town in australia (laughs) <laughs> and Elliot and I, he, him and I were like, uh, we met in year seven or something. So we were real young. And, and I remember the first conversation was, what's your favorite film? And he said, uh, Pulp Fiction. And he said, what's yours? And I said, Clockwork Orange, which is pretty weird for a kid that young. And ever since then, we just bonded on films. And uh, he, uh, we made actually our first short film together called Liver Pie, which is somewhere out there in the ether, but it's extremely inappropriate. It got banned from, from high school because it was so graphic and violent, and just a, a blood fest, basically. But um, anyway, Elliot, uh, who now works for Filmic Pro, he, is, uh, he was amazing. He was like instrumental. He, he helped us a lot with any tech support and everything like that. And he's just a mastermind when it comes to to that app and he does a lot of amazing things for that company and he has obviously worked a lot with uh, the new uh, project we did the little ad for their new update and the the LUTs that they're doing so yeah Elliot Baring another shout out to him he 
he's the man. I love the guy to death. So he helped a lot. Just uh, he helped Dave a lot, particularly with any little hiccups and things like that. But Filmic are really good in in assisting with any sort of tech support. So you know they're amazing for that, and Elliot particularly is amazing for that too. I talked to Dave. We went over all the technical aspects, and that was enlightening. Back when you shot it, a couple you shot this a couple of years ago, by the way, back in yeah. 2019, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So tech has changed a lot in that time. Yeah, it has. But non-tech related with the iPhone, how was it working with it as a creative partner, more or less? In other words, you'll occasionally hear actors or directors say that they like it because it can be unobtrusive. Now, granted, you guys were putting big lenses on it and stuff, so it started looking more like a traditional cinema camera. Yep. But it's still portable compared to really big cameras, even outfitted like that. So were there advantages or disadvantages that you found as the director and actor working in that, working with it that way? Yeah, um, I'll start with the disadvantages because there weren't that many, in my opinion. Uh, Dave might uh, beg to differ a little bit, obviously, because he had to deal with all of that. And I didn't really, him being DP, camera operator, data wrangler, all that sort of stuff. There were just a few little workarounds that we had to figure out, which... I believe now, as you were saying, two years ago, we shot it. Uh, Filmic has uh, fixed a lot of the little sort of, you know, annoying things that popped up. So they're very good at quickly fixing things up. And they got a lot of feedback from us, too, which was beneficial for them, which have now tweaked. But besides those like little things, um, for me as a director and an actor, none whatsoever. Because back when I first started to work professionally, I actually would get pretty nervous. Like, you know, I did this thing, it was a James Cameron production and I was kind of nervous going into it because it was shot in a big film studio and it was like a three camera setup and it was all green screens and so much going on. But I just kind of went back to realizing that for an actor, it's like, it's the same premise that I've just got a script to learn. And regardless of whether it's an iPhone or an Alexa or an IMAX camera, your job's the same. It's just to learn your lines and have done the, done the hard yards and you deliver. So it doesn't, it didn't affect me at all in that respect. In that regard, it's, um, you know, it, it's pointed at you from one direction or another, and then you're in the moment. And so it doesn't matter at all. Like there's, there's no difference whatsoever performance wise. And then uh, directing wise, no, like having as long as your DP is solid, you're good to go. It doesn't it doesn't matter for me. I found no disadvantages whatsoever. That's great. And the deal is when I first saw your movie, I saw it on the Filmic Pro uh, contest or I saw maybe I saw the trailer. I forget. Maybe it was. Anyway, the point is, I didn't know it was shot on the phone, even though it was in their contest because of the way y'all shot it. It yeah. looked and, and the aspect ratio, it looked like 16 millimeter, maybe, you know, which is cool. I mean, it had that 80s vibe anyway, but it just, it didn't look like a phone. And ultimately what I always preach, even though I run a channel about iPhone filmmaking is that no one cares what you shoot on the audience. Filmmakers care. We're, that's people watching this. They're interested, mm. but the general audience doesn't care. But in particular, with I always say, shoot on whatever you want. You just want it to look good. When I say they don't care, they care as long they don't want to be pulled out of the story because of tech issues. But with your movie, it just didn't look like a phone at all. And so I've been touting that and using that as an example, you know, of how to make a film on a phone. If you there's certain films you want to look more like a phone, or certain projects you don't care. Everything you did is what you normally preach. Don't do. You shot those low light scenes with the when you were on the date. And you're in the, the house, the shots with the mirror and all that. I mean, you would usually never do that with a phone. I mean, you guys yeah. really, you really push the tech. Totally. But that's, but that's great. And so the, the point being is you were saying that it felt normal to you on set. But the, the flip side to that is when you watch the movie, it feels normal too. There's no, you're not sacrificing anything, which is great. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and one, one thing I absolutely loved is like, because we basically... Uh, privately fund all of our projects. What I noticed is when we, when it was accepted into a lot of the big 
film festivals, they obviously then screen it on a beautiful big cinema screen. Right. And um, no one really knew it was shot on an iPhone, even though it's like written in the program and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, it was really nice doing the Q&As afterwards and people that had a lot of funding from different funding bodies. And, you know, I, I always just found that to get like government funding, because there's a lot of that in Australia and or like a sponsorship deal from, you know, a company or, or whatever it is. Um, we don't have any of that just because I find going through the route it just takes forever. And I'm, I'm really shit at writing grant applications and all that stuff. Like, I just don't like it. Um, it takes too long. And, you know, I, I don't want to give away any creative freedom or something, you know, with that sort of thing. So when, when it played at the festivals, it was really kind of like a little dig, not to be like mean spinner or anything, just to be like, yeah, we shot on an iPhone and everyone's like, no one noticed. Like it stood up against all the other films that were shot on Alexas and Reds and everything like that. No one knew. And so, so then when I said it afterwards, people were pretty shocked. You yeah. Know? And it, it was nice. I mean, the main thing about a phone that I love, and it's one of the ideas behind my channel when it comes to the filmmaking side, that is that it gives people hope that they can do it too. Okay. And then of course the old, you know, the cream rise to the top in the end, it doesn't matter. It takes the talent of the actors, the writing, the directing to make it all work. Just because you have an Alexa doesn't mean your film is going to be good. <laughs> totally. And, totally. But from a indie filmmaking DIY filmmaking perspective to know that you guys, what you guys pulled off with a phone and you funded it yourself, it's inspiring and gives people hope that they can do something like that too. And I think that's important, especially when you're starting out. Yeah. Well, thanks for saying that, Blake, because that actually means a lot to me that, I mean, I hope, you know, you always hope whatever you do has a positive impact in a way. So if, if you can have like an inspiring impact, you know, that means the world to me. Um, and just that people, you know, enjoy it. And like you said, it is, it's, just, it's, it's simply about the story, regardless of what you shoot on. Absolutely. And, and that's why I love your channel so much as well, because it really can just be done on, on an iPhone. I mean, you're seeing Steven Soderbergh, Sean Baker, yeah. these remarkably talented people, and they do it. And that was actually one of the reasons, another reason we were really inspired to shoot it. And, and Sean Baker actually saw it because he's uh, worked with Film McPro uh, a little mm -hmm. bit. And, um, he was one of the judges in that competition. And he sent us a really lovely message to saying, you know, he, he really, really loved it and he'd love to work with us in the future. So that was just like, that alone was so exciting because, you know, I'm a big fan of his and he's just ridiculously talented. So it is that sort of thing that, yeah, it, it, it really doesn't matter. It's like, you know, the iPhone is a perfect tool and it's only going to get better and better for that sort of thing. So yeah. So did you guys make the movie as a calling card type film um, to go to festivals? It sounds like you already had a lot of work you had done in the past, but a lot of people make shorts as either a proof of concept or, you know, a calling card. Is that kind of what you guys were looking, thinking? Uh, not particularly, no. Okay. Um, just for fun? Trying, <laughs> yeah, it, it will do, yeah, just to make something that you believe in, really, like it. Well, I guess it you does. did say you did it for the um, film at pro contest, which was the impetus originally, but yeah, I mean, but it, it, to be totally honest with you as well, it was a great excuse just to get over to Bali and enjoy mm -hmm. ourselves as well. I don't like just holidaying. Like I, I liked it. I never, uh, I like to be working always. So to be able to have the luxury of go somewhere that you love and be able to enjoy yourself, but you're working as well. It's like the double impact you know it's the double whammy of and then it's um, a tax write-off too <laughs> it totally and it's a, it really really is so that that's a beautiful thing as well um so yeah the, there was all of that too but yeah it, it really was as well though it was a little story that james and i really like loved and believed in too so and we just thought it was weird and it was kind of quirky but deep down it was it was kind of deep like we hope it what comes across with it it, it, it you know it's kind of about fragile masculinity in a way i mean as like an undertone i don't like to get too wanky or philosophical with all that type of stuff you just hope right. if it comes across it comes across you know yeah. what i mean but you know it's kind of dark in a way and 
you know, with the whole suicide, attempted suicide at the right. beginning of the film and, and, and all that. Spoiler stuff. alert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe he does kill himself. I don't know. Who yeah, knows? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mis- we uh, have but, mystery here. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, it actually originally came from a concept uh, for a film that James and I came up with about five years ago called Birds in Paradise, about two, like, washed up lounge singers in Florida that uh, are once again kind of like expat vibe. And and then, you know, one idea turns into another. And then when you get a location like Bali, it just changes and you adapt and you improvise the story to the location, which is something I really like to do, which is kind of like the Dogma 95. Is that what it's called? Dogma 95? Yeah. That's our filmmaking. Kind of yeah. like that. You just get there and then you use kind of what you can. So I, I really love that style of filmmaking. We don't abide to all the rules, you know, right. that they You do, can't but, use uh, lights or whatever. You know, they had a whole list yeah. of rules, right? <laughs> yeah. You, that, you, you can know, only I, have music in your film that someone is actually playing. You can't actually use it. a score, you know. That. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I do really love that stuff. Like, uh, what was that film, Festin or Feistin? Or, yeah, or there was a whole celebration. There was a whole yeah. slew of them in the mid-90s, yeah. Yeah, when I first saw that, I was like, I genuinely thought that that was one of the best films I had seen in a long time. And um, like, I don't even know what that was shot on, but it looks shit. You know, I yeah. mean that in, in, in the biggest. I mean, a lot of those were shot on video later in the nineties and I mean, yeah. mini DV and that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and that just leads me actually into a point Blake I wanted to mention was um, in terms of shooting on the iPhone, very freeing, very amazing, looks exactly how I wanted it to look with that 16 millimeter style feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and in saying that, though, it was really important that I take my hat off to Dave Cleave and James Ballard in terms of the grading and everything. We, we definitely didn't want to mimic to make it look like it was shot on film at all. We just wanted it to have that look. Mm-hmm. So it's like you sometimes see when people put too much grain on it, and 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 make it try and come across as that which you know that wasn't the ambition it was just to stylistically have that and yeah. there, I, I think there's a fine line which i hope we achieve um well yeah but, every camera has its own look i mean whether it's a red camera and alexa i mean they all have their own look but in the end we're all going for the film look because that's what our eye is used to but yeah. that's a whole nother conversation but I know what you're saying, and I agree with you. You can't, you can try to get a cinematic look or a film look, but it's never going to look like film. I mean, even yeah. putting gate weave and, like you say, grant film grain and all the different gamma curves, and you know, mm. you can you can get close, you can simulate it, but it's not the same. <laughs> no, it just isn't. If, if if you want it to look like film, shoot on. Got to shoot film. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> actually, I'd love to ask you this, Blake, and maybe this is. Um, it might be interesting to to your audience, but James and I have had a lot of chats with this because we've shot on film a couple of times. He did mm-hmm. a music video a while ago when he shot on 16 millimeter. And I mean, if it's like, if you were to talk to maybe like the maestro of all maestros of shooting on film, which would, I would consider uh, Quentin Tarantino, of course, um, uh, we were kind of like, what is it? You know, because you can get so close to that look. And this might sound just weird or it might just be in my head, but if you got like the best grader in the world and, the, you know, a top cinematographer and you shot it on the Alexa or the Red and then you did everything you could to make it mimic film and then you put it next to like a Tarantino film, the one thing I can seem to tell the difference because you can get it so close, it's like when you do watch stuff truly shot on film, be it 16, 35, whatever, it's almost like you can see the density of objects in film. It's like it's almost like when you look at like a stereo or or something that's like it almost like you go, well, I can kind of almost tell how much that weighs or I was gonna say you're or, talking about almost you can feel the weight in a way of it. Yeah, like you can okay. truly feel see like the value or the the density or the true just the the true sort of richness of an object or or and skin tones is obviously a big thing too so i don't know if that makes any sense to you at all or if it's just yeah in my head. i mean 
I, it does. I mean, to a degree for sure. I mean, we don't see, we don't see film as much anymore for one, you know, Christopher Nolan, Tarantino, that's about it. And like right now I'm, I'm, I'm late because I have kids. And so my kids over the years have got me from not watching shows. And so I'm way behind on the walking dead, but I've been catching up on the walking dead and that's all shot 16 millimeter. And mm. I love it. And when I'm watching it, it just, it almost feels like you're watching a show from the eighties or the seventies, even um, they add a lot of good, have a lot of grain in there. But the point is when I watch it, I do feel different, even though it's a network TV show on AMC, everything else is shot with the Alexa. Now, interestingly, I'm not there yet. The last two seasons because of the pandemic have been shot on the Alexa and I haven't watched it yet, but as a filmmaker, I can't wait to compare because they've been saying it, it looks and feels different to them, the guys making it. But as a general audience, I don't know if it will. But your point is, I don't know if that's how I would describe it, but I, your point is well taken. I understand what you're saying. There yeah. is a difference. Well, you always makes a lot more sense. It's a feel. It's a feel. Yeah, it, 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 it is. It's, it. it has an extra organic vibe to it or just character to it. And I've shot film too. I came up in the 90s, late 90s. And I shot 16 and I worked on some 35 millimeter shoots. I never directed or produced anything in 35. I've done a lot of 16 though, and super 16. My first feature I did, I, I shot on uh, 16 millimeter, four by three, which has made a big comeback, you know, you for years, yeah. it was like, oh, four by three, you can't do that. And now it's like, that's what people want to do. Or they shoot, yeah. they shoot widescreen and crop it in. <laughs> Is that a is it what's that what was that film called? Is that is that available somewhere that I, I know I that that um it is it's like available in one country and but I, that's the kind of like what you were saying. It was a yeah. learner. It was a beginner film. I was you know yeah, I was okay. a kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I have a lot of films that are out there. But all my films that are out there have been shot digitally. When you send me an email, I'll send you some links if you're interested in checking out some of my work. I'm, I'm here yeah, to promote great. you, not promote me. <laughs> yeah, okay okay <laughs> just a couple more questions and we'll wrap this up so please please the the pandemic we've talked about that a couple of times that affected your festival run because i mean we just yeah. mentioned your film was shot like two years ago but you're just now rolling it out talk a little bit about that did you do online stuff were a lot of the festivals you were entered in canceled and then they like rescheduled how'd that work yeah so we were because it was a little while ago, uh, it was it was a little bit before stuff started to get closed down. So okay, we played at uh, Santa Barbara International Film Festival, which was a great one. Uh, so shout out to them as well because that was a they were really accommodating and they you know they get big stars there. Brad Pitt, Renee Zellweger, and all sorts of amazing people were there. Um, I don't think they watched our film; they were more there, you know, to do their thing, but. For the shorts department, they still, you know, it was in beautiful cinemas. And so that was really exciting. And then it played at a couple of others. But then, yeah, the rest of them were online festivals. And no offense to anyone uh, and not to dishearten anyone. But my experience was it just kind of took the magic right out of it. Like yeah. it, it just wasn't exciting. And I don't know how many people are watching it. And they did their absolute best so yeah. you know all respect to them for doing it and you know they had to and it, it and it still drives it forward and encourages people to keep making it through this difficult time yeah but yeah online festivals for me have just been very underwhelming and and it kind of they just come and go and it's just not as exciting you know like the the, the the dream is always just to sit in a cinema and then have people have that feeling of people enjoying your work and talk to people afterwards and yeah and do it that route. So I love seeing my films on the big screen, but I'm also a realist and maybe not a purist. I just want people to see the work. And so exactly. ultimately if I got a deal, if I'm a filmmaker and got a deal with Netflix or got my mm. show on Amazon or whatever, I'm cool with that. I would love to get just work out to the world now, but on the flip side of that, what I do love about festivals is interacting with the audience, like you said, but also meeting other filmmakers. So mm. when you're doing online festivals, you can't do that. At that point, in my humble opinion, you might as well just put it on YouTube because you're going to get the most views there anyway. And then you can interact with people there for better or worse. <laughs> no, the, the YouTube absolutely. comment section can be tricky sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why, um, Blake, I was so, so pleased that after you did the interview with uh, Dave Cleave, 
I just saw how many people responded to that and how many people watched it. And it's like, truly, that is the only thing that matters is how many people see it. That's the reason we do it. Yeah. And you've got an amazing platform. And also it's, um, it's the right platform for the type of people that are film enthusiasts and people that like to do guerrilla filmmaking and shoot on an iPhone. And, and so it's like finding the right audience, which is half the battle anyway. So yeah. That's true. Like, I, I love it, too. And, and going back to that, like us just doing our own thing, like we've actually now become it's, it's, it's a different world now. Like we uh, James and I have uh, our, our kind of project September 87. We just made that. We put it on YouTube and the first one, which we shot a little while ago, just racked up the, the hits because it's um, they're like music videos with a bit of narrative. And okay. James being a very, very talented musician, it's all of his music, uh, along with Will Ewing, who is in the band. And it's sort of sci-fi uh, synth pop music and uh, sort of set in the 80s once again. Um, and that was as simple as we made it, did everything on our own, released it. And uh, simply from that and then releasing another one that has led to um, us now uh, doing something um, pretty, pretty big, which we're, I can't talk too much about because we're signing the NDAs and everything, but, you know, we will be turning that into um, something a lot bigger, which is kind of, I think, what most people, you know, like us doing guerrilla stuff or, or always aim for. So luckily we done a deal. I, I don't know how much I can say, but, We've done a deal, basically. I'm allowed to say that. I can't go into specifics, but we're off to LA in a month uh, because after lengthy negotiations and everything like that, we will be turning that into uh, something quite big, which hopefully in the next sort of uh, four or five months, we'll be able to, well, there will be just announcements made. But um, yeah, that was simple. That came from, you know, just putting it on YouTube and getting eyeballs on it. And we're in a position now where, you can take it into your own hands and, and algorithms and numbers don't lie. So if it's good and people like it, it'll lead to great things. And we, we see it all the time. You know, I, I don't know why all of a sudden I thought of like Jake Paul and, and his brother, but it's, it's similar to those guys, you know, like they just hustled and, and they're now monumentally popular and famous and successful. And, and they've done their own thing. They've really done their own thing. And I know that's a, it's very different to filmmaking what they do, but yeah, they're, I, they're basically vloggers. Um, and yeah. they, uh, of course they've gotten into boxing and both of them have, I guess, Logan and Jake. So, yeah. but, uh, yeah, yeah they built a, they, they, they started small like everybody and built up an audience on YouTube, totally different yeah. kind of, it's more like reality TV, YouTube reality yeah. TV. Um, but yeah. it obviously does well for, for a certain group like that the demographic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But it's like the, the fundamental principles remain the same. It's like you just, yeah. you do what you love and then you put it out there and we, we can do that now, you know? So no, for sure. I'm very, I'm, I'm very honored and happy that it's going to premiere with, with your channel. And it's no, like, no, it's great. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful you guys reached out to me and we talked about doing this. I'm, I am excited to share it cause I've been talking about it. And the number one of the number one comments I got on the, on the video I did with Dave, and or the podcast end video was when can we see the movie and i kept having to say <laughs> someday one day we don't know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, the, yeah sorry sorry for the hold up it was just there was one last film festival that um we were just waiting to hear back from and then they got delayed and delayed and they kept kind of they didn't want to do the, the online thing and it was looking like we were in a position um in that particular city where they would be able to do a, a, a like a proper festival and then in the end, um, we didn't get into the festival. So oh, it was kind of like, we, we just had to wait. <laughs> we had submitted. So, you know, whatever. I'm much more, I'm happier now that we can do it this way anyways. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy we're doing it this way anyway. Well, you kind of answered my last question, which is, what are you guys doing next? And you kind of alluded yeah. to it. The only question I had to follow up, I know you, you said you can't talk details, but can you answer whether it's a movie or a TV or streaming kind of show? It's going to be a television show, um, and it will most likely end up on a streaming platform, depending okay. on a couple of things. But uh, yeah, it'll be. It's a TV show, and it's um, it's yeah, it's the real deal. It's it's really exciting. It's, it's for been U.S. Real... U.S. television or Australian, or is it worldwide kind of thing? 
it'll be worldwide. Okay. Yeah. But uh, funded and made out of uh, out of the states and everything okay. like that, and, and perhaps you know it'll be shot here in Australia. But it's all to be determined. The people we're working with, even though they're like the the big big dogs, like you know, there's always that thing. It's like dealing with with executives and this and that. But the people we're dealing with have just been amazing from beginning to end. It, it definitely has taken a very very long time, which everyone I've talked to is has told me to prepare for that because there's lawyers and there's executives and there's a million different moving parts. And it's gone from, you know, a French producer and then taken here and taken there and sold there and bought there. And you, you just learn and roll with the punches with, it. and I, I'm, I feel, I feel like I'm at a place in my life where I'm, I'm very confident that we've done the hard yards, you know, we've paid our dues. So it's kind of like just um, bring it on, you know, like I don't feel intimidated or whatever. It's like, you, you know, your worth as a creative and, and the re they came to us. So it's like, That's they great. like what we have and, and, you know, we're willing to, to collaborate and work with people much more talented than we are. So it's just exciting. You know, it's, it's, it's a great position to be in. My um, last thing I'll say here, um, but my, Initial entry into YouTube was on a with a was a web series back in 2007 called Pink, and it's a mm -hmm. dark comedy about a female assassin looking for love. Well, that video went viral, and exact same story happened to me that's happening to you. I got signed by an agent. They came looking for us, and we I got a deal with Warner Brothers. I did a Warner Brothers show, and it sounds exactly like yours. We did get the show made, but it took a long time, and mm -hmm. it was a traditional Hollywood story where you go in and it was awesome. And I met tons of great people and I worked with some of the top agents in the business, but it didn't have a Hollywood ending. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the only reason I say that is my show got made, but didn't go anywhere in the end. That's why I love to kind of straddle both worlds. I love indie filmmaking and DIY filmmaking and no hard feelings filmmaking short films because you have an idea, you don't need a lot of money and you just go make it. So, but what you're talking about is all obviously what we all strive to do. And I love that stuff too, because it's awesome to raise the budgets, raise the profile and have someone else pay for your project. <laughs> Especially when you're talking yeah. about big, you know, distribution TV shows, that is what we all strive for. But even the guys, like you mentioned, Soderbergh, what I love about him is he does these big Ocean's Eleven movies and then he goes and make an iPhone movie. You know what I mean? So, yep. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Blake. And I, I guarantee you this, no matter what direction things go, it's like I'm going to do what I've always done with like any money I make or any, uh, you know, uh, power, so to speak, pull that I get. Yeah. It's like my main ambition would be to like, have my own little production company, like a lot of the people I admire, like the Soderberghs and the Sean Bakers and and the Robert Rodriguez's, you know what I mean? Yep. And still do my own thing. Like w during the time that we've had to wait while lawyers and and business affairs and, you know, our lawyer, entertainment lawyer, Bryce Menzies, shout out to him. He's been amazing <laughs> dealing with, you know, million page contracts and stuff. James Knight, have still been doing our own thing. We, we've shot another music video for our project. We've, um, we're going to be doing something, a short form thing with Filmic Pro and also a shout out to Antoine Dizel, uh, if that's how I pronounce his name. He's French. Uh, Dizel, I believe it is called. Uh, he's an amazing guy. So uh, uh, anyone check him out because he's about to do some really exciting stuff with the mini series, short form platform stuff. He's a really creative guy. And he, he's the one that put us in touch with the big, uh, some of the big studios in LA. And so, awesome. you know, he, he very much encourages, uh, you know, the shorter form stuff. So I'll, I'll always do it because you have free, creative freedom, you know, that's what everyone's looking for. So I'll always keep doing it, Blake. Always. Yeah, that's great. Well, tell people where they can find more about you. You guys, you have a website. You mentioned Instagram. Can you drop some? Um, yeah. Um, well, one thing straight up is uh, to see more of uh, James, uh, myself and James's stuff. Our, our big thing is September 87 that we're working on. So if you just Google September 87, you'll see 
Um, a couple of music videos pop up. It should be the first thing. Uh, the first one's Bad Dream Baby. It's pretty amazing, I think. And uh, <laughs> the next one is Light Years as well. I will uh, mainly, you can get a lot of stuff from our Instagram. I'll always put little things up there and that's where you can see the new uh filmic pro thing we've, we've done with them as well so i'm not huge on social media and yeah. stuff like that but that's just kind of the world we live in kind of keeping up yeah. with everybody you know around the world i'm in texas right now you're in uh australia so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah totally totally but i'll always put updates to that sort of thing so um thank you so much for taking the time um as I mentioned to you i mean i'm a huge fan of this movie and i can't wait to see the others i, I haven't seen your previous work um, but I'm going to now I'm going to check it out and I look forward to seeing what you guys are working on because again, uh, blown away by what you did on an iPhone. But again, it wasn't just the phone. Dave did a great job as the DP, but the story you told, it was funny. It was heartfelt. It was emotional. It had all the ingredients you need. And as an indie film, you don't always, always, you don't always get that. And you don't always have great acting because you guys are good actors too. So Thank you. Uh, Thank across you the so board, much. excellent job. And I, I think it's just Thank you. something that really yeah. everyone can look up to. So uh, I'm so sorry James couldn't be here. He genuinely sends his sincere apologies, but you know, he is my creative counterpart and he's a mastermind. You know, like without him, I couldn't do, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do. And him and I just work really well together. And I'm just very lucky I have such a good creative counterpart. And James Ballard. When you watch this, uh, you know, you're here in spirit. So uh, he, he's he's the man, you know, he is really the man. He's and, and he's a huge fan of yours, Blake. So, um, yeah, I just had to say that. That's awesome. I, love, I appreciate yeah. it. Well, well, thanks again, Paul. I appreciate you being on the show. Cool. Thank you so much. And uh, take care. I don't know about you, but that was an inspiring chat. I love hearing about indie filmmakers getting success or having success. And I also love it, of course, because they shot this on an iPhone. And speaking of that, if you haven't already, be sure to check out the actual short film on my YouTube channel. That's on my main iPhoneographer's YouTube channel. It is really well done. I can't say enough good things about that film. Well, that's it for this episode. Don't forget, if you're interested in learning more about mobile filmmaking, check out my courses. Links are in the show notes of this episode. My courses cover smartphone cinematography, the Filmic Pro app, which was very prominent in the production of No Hard Feelings, along with LumaFusion color grading, and also smartphone audio production. You put all those together, and hopefully you too can create your own short film like No Hard Feelings, or whatever project you wanna do using your phone. It's a great time to be a filmmaker, as I often say, and my next podcast, the iPhone 13 will be released. And so my previous episode, I speculated about ProRes coming to the phone. And so we will know about that soon, next week actually. And I will come back and give a commentary on what's happening with the new device. Well, thanks for listening guys. This has been another episode of Almost Professional. I'm your host, Blake Calhoun. And I look forward to talking to you in the next episode.